Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are underneath the awning in the visitor center because there is a hurricane on the way. But we got a horticulture hour to do right now, and nothing's going to stop that from happening. What the horticulture hour is, it's an hour long question and answer session. We've got a panel of horticulturists here. We've got Mark Weathington, our director. We've got Greg Page, our director of horticulture and Tim Alderton, our research technician. And they are here to answer your questions. Okie dokie. So I think that is enough announcements for today. So I think we can get started with this horticulture hour. So everybody joining us at home, this is a live Q and A session. So if you've got questions about anything, everything, anything at all about horticulture, plants, whatever, you can drop them in the chat and I will relay them to our panel of horticulturists here to answer those questions. We did have, well, we did intro to gardening in the South this past weekend and one of our online participants who is also a member of the Arboretum and asks wonderful questions regularly, just a wonderful question that we didn't have time to cover during intro to gardening in the South. So I think we can start out with that question. Marilyn asks, I built a brick raised bed 13 years ago, filled them with compost slash soil mix and planted perennials, blueberry shrubs and vines. Everything did great, but now the soil level is about half to a third of what it was when they first put it in. She's asking, can I just add a few inches of mulch annually or I need, do I need to lift the plants, add new soil and replant? One of the blueberry shrubs is now eight feet tall, which means I can't dig that up. <laughs> I would say um, you can try adding a bit every year. Um, one thing you can do, uh, especially if you're, you're adding a bit every year, is get uh, an expanded uh, slate product like Permatil and mix that in. And that way, even though you're, you're adding on top of all the roots and everything there, you are providing uh, enough pore space so that oxygen will be there and you won't smother your roots. And we've used that on top of, of established trees and, and kind of made mounds uh, doing that. So you can do that. The, the, bigger, the big problem is what you've got in there already is so broken down that it's just, it's mucky, it's, it's collapsed, it's not very, it's not very conducive to really growing plants great. And in an ideal world, you would dig everything out of there. And when you went back in, use something that would be like a uh, rooftop mix. That's what we used in our raised beds and our lath house is uh, a soil mix that is made to go on rooftops because they don't want to have to keep replacing the soil as it breaks down. Yeah, that, that compost, if you put a high percentage of that in there, that, all, yeah, that always come, uh, breaks down into nothing more or less over time. And if she needs to, I mean, do that, I would suggest wait until everything goes dormant and you could dig out that blueberry, I hate to say it, um, yeah, in, actually... in the winter and raise your soil level, level significantly. Um, that way and that may allevi alleviate some of that issue but using something more stable like you said like the, you're gonna the have the same problems again if you don't yeah if yeah if you don't use something that's um, more mineral uh, yeah. that stays there unlike the, the organic matter but then continue to add your organic matter over time yeah um, yeah if you just try and raise it with mulch or, or uh, you know soil conditioner or something like that it's just going to keep breaking down i will say something you know with with raised beds we kind of always think that everything has to be at the same level, but if you come out here and go to our rooftop, which is basically a raised bed, you'll see that we have mounds and we have lowered. So if you don't want to dig out this eight foot blueberry, you could kind of leave it at its level, maybe put a little bit of soil on there, but dig out the herbaceous material and mound up and, and create some topography in this raised bed. So it doesn't have to be you know, completely flat. So you can do, parts of, of those and that blueberry the blueberries roots will grow into the new soil awesome okay so following up on that somebody did ask what is a rooftop mix so could you elaborate on that a bit sure the the rooftop what what you want in a rooftop mix in general is very low organic matter um hot, much higher mineral content because you don't want it to break down over time um, and, and do what we were talking about before. So it usually has, uh, it can have coarse sand, it can have permatil. Ours it was uh, very much uh, permatil 
fines. So not the big chunky um, rocks you see, but fines. But those still have, the, have a lot of airspace in them and provide space for, for plants to grow around. And then it had a, a mineral rich uh, sifted topsoil and uh, about maybe 10% uh, organic matter. And yeah, that's been real stable over time. It's and been a decade. Yeah, or more than a decade. That was 2007. Uh, oh, I was thinking laugh when I was the talking laugh about house. the oh, laugh, yeah, the laugh house. So that's been 11 years. Yeah. So yeah, uh, but let's see if there's something else I had in my head whenever you were saying about that. But yeah, uh, that, that would be real good. Okay. Oh, the, I know what it was. The, the permatill you were saying about pore space, that sand is crystalline and it doesn't have that pore space in it and in the same way that the, the um, permatill does. Yeah, so. if given the option, I would always go with permatill over sand. Bigger surface area. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Okay, so this question might be more appropriate to a panel of entomologists, but <laughs> somebody said, any of these passion flower varieties good for the Gulf Fritillary? Yes. Okay. So actually, ugh, I almost brought some of the caterpillars which uh, out with me, but um, probably you'd get them on the incarnatas uh, the most, which is our native uh, passion flower. But I have seen them on um, Lady Margaret, which she's a little bit more difficult to grow. She's a little more tender. And I have seen them on, um, Inspiration. Those are all um, incarnate. Those are both incarnata hybrids as well. So um, they that is our native eastern um, um, most common passion flower, and so they are, will readily go for those. I don't typically see it on cerulea, which is the common blue or uh, the blue passion flower. This one right here, um, but theoretically they should eat any of them if they get desperate enough. So, uh, but incarnata. And I've seen Gulf fritillaries on um, caterpillars on uh, some of the tropical ones. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, um, so, yeah. And they use them for almost all the heliconid butterflies. The, um, they use them to, to rear those, and they, uh, lots of the tropical ones are used. Okie dokie. So the next question comes from one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Cynthia, and it, it does break my heart a little bit, but here you go. She says, we have a three-year-old garden, new home, and a lot of clay and otherwise bad <laughs> soil. I've been trying to improve the soil by adding mulch and organic matter. However, I have discovered that we are infested with jumping worms that are chewing through the organic matter without improving my soil. What can I do? It's, 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 there's some irony here. Um, we did a, a talk this afternoon and about pests in the garden, and one of the questions, uh, the, the thing you never prepare for is what always gets asked and jumping worms was definitely one of those. It's not anything that I have a lot of information on. It's something that I'm hearing more about. And my, uh, my Reader's Digest definition that I've kind of gleaned is it's an it's a invasive earthworm that really goes through the organic matter quickly and breaks it down much quicker than we can replenish it. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that that's a bigger problem in an uncontrolled environment. In a garden, you can, you can add more organic matter. Um, and and that's, that's what I would prescribe for, for something like this. Um, stay, stay tuned. Um, I, need to, I need to do some research on this and figure out more about it because more and more people seem to be concerned and, and asking about it. Um, I think it's more of a problem. Um, where did you say, Sophia? Uh, that oh, I, I would say in Iowa, I know it's a big problem. Upper Midwest. Midwest. Midwest the Midwest, but um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information on it. It's, I have not seen them here, uh, thank goodness. Yeah, well, it's only a matter of time. Um, I, and I, I'm, we like to speak about what we know and we don't know much um, personally. Uh, I know there's some good information on some of the North Carolina Extension uh, uh, website, so you can go. You can go there. That'll be that'll be our first stop. Is is looking at that. Um, but yeah, I would I would you know, adding adding organic matter faster than they can get rid of it is is I guess the the best. Um, Collect all your neighbor's leaves. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So next question: Mark and Bree Arthur have both suggested daikon radishes to aerate hard packed soil. So we planted an area with them a month or so ago. Every time the daikons put up leaves, critters, likely bunnies, <laughs> chomp them to the ground. Are we out of luck? 
<laughs> this has been a banner year for rabbits. I've never seen as many rabbits in our garden, in home landscapes, in my neighborhood. Um, for whatever reason, there's a lot of them. Um, the best control for those are coyotes and foxes. Um, invite them to your neighborhood. That's going to be the best way to kind of get them under control. Um, other than that, um, yeah, I'd say, so I, this is a little early in my mind. I'm usually mid-September is when I would, when I generally would sow um, the daikon uh, radishes and, and make sure I always tell buy tillage radishes, not daikon. Same thing, daikon radishes seed is expensive. Tillage radish seed is cheap. Um, if you're worried that they really got to them, get some more seed and re-sow and sow thick. So it real, real nice and thick. They can't get it all. Okay. Somebody's asking, how do I manage aphids? I've been using neem oil, but I prefer not to use anything so as not to deter any potential pollinators. I know that ladybugs will help, but how do I get ladybugs? I have lots of pollinator friendly plants, but the ladybugs aren't coming. I've seen that you can buy them online, but are those a native to NC variety? <laughs> or do I just need to accept that 2023 is the year of the aphid? Aphids are, I mean, they're, they're going to be a problem forever. Um, and we talked about these this afternoon in a, in a lecture. Um, they reproduce so quickly, it's hard to keep up with them. Um, you know, I've used water to try to, to reduce their numbers on plants. Um, I don't like neem oil. I hate the way that it smells more than anything. Um, the, the soaps work just as good as neem for, for aphids. Um, in terms of beneficials, um, there's, there's two that I would recommend, and you can buy them both. Uh, green lacewing larvae, um, you can buy the eggs and you can buy the, the larvae themselves. The eggs are much less expensive than the larvae. Um, and if they hatch out, they're, they're a voracious uh, predator of, of aphids. Um, same with, with ladybugs, you can buy the adult ladybugs. The problem is um, when you release them, they're not gonna go where you want them to go. They're gonna go where they want to go. So one trick that I've told people to do um, is to get a small spray bottle with Sprite or Mountain Dew, pick your flavor. Before you release them, spray that on the foliage of the plants that you want it to go on, and the aphids will be drawn to that sugar when you release them because they've been the, in the, the, lady, the, the ladybugs. The, the ladybugs, thank you. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, the ladybugs have been slightly desiccated. They're in a bag full of sawdust or, or other, other anti-desiccant. And when they're released, they want to, to satisfy that urge first. So spraying that, that sh high sugar content liquid, they'll be attracted to that and then naturally go to the, to the aphids. The lady beetle, um, it's the larva stage that does the best work. Um, and I don't think you can buy those, but just by having those in your garden, you're gonna get to that cycle because the adults will lay eggs and then you'll, you'll get the larva. So are those the native ones or are those imported ones? Well. They're generally native North American okay. ones, but okay. the, the question was NC. I don't yeah. know that they're North Carolina. Um, no. They've probably been reared in captivity for so long it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a, 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 lot of them, a moot point. A lot of them come from uh, the Mid-Atlantic. There's a big uh, IPM uh, beneficial insect lab in Canada. They actually harvest them with shop backs. <laughs> um, you know, they're, you know, you're not going to find native insects native to, to North Carolina, unfortunately. I, and I want to go back to one of the, the very first thing that Greg said, which is water. Yeah. You know, get a high pressure nozzle for your hose and spray them. You won't get them all. Don't be don't worry about that. But you blow those things off your plants and it's like hiking up the Himalayas on your knees for them to get back. They just. They won't. Now they 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 reproduce so quickly. They will the ones that are left will produce more quickly. But generally, I don't consider aphids a real problem outside in the garden. In most cases, they um, you know they'll build up in numbers. Something will come along and and eat them when they get to be enough. If it's something herbaceous, it cut it all the way back. Cut, cut it back. Mm -hmm. Get rid of it clip out where they're, they're feeding on stuff. Um, a lot of times when you're spraying to them, even if it's neem, even if it's soap or an oil, you're gonna get some of that on some of the beneficials, either the adults, the larvae, or the eggs. 
and the beneficials can never reproduce as quickly as the aphids do. So maybe taking that out of the equation, try to, to get them at bay with, with water, and the beneficials will come. Um, if you've got populations, you'll, you'll eventually see them come into to that, to the site. Well, we did have a response to your answer, and they said that I've tried water, but it knocks the flowers off too. The flowers will come back. <laughs> When we, when we say water, it's, it's an alternative to, to other things. Um, you know, a, a big part of having an integrated pest management plan is having a, a threshold of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've worked in gardens where we sprayed insecticides every five days. And I've worked in gardens where we didn't use any. And the gardens where we didn't use any, we had better control of most uh, insects and diseases. So... Aphids, unfortunately, are something that we, as, a, as, as gardeners, short-term and long-term, it's just, it's just a part of the equation. Yeah. There's plants that are more prone to it than other things, and it's just, you know, it just comes with the territory, unfortunately. Sure. And you learn to enjoy them. I mean, think about on your, your um, butterfly weed. Those aphids are gorgeous. Oh, they're bright orange. orange. I mean, And they basically stick to the things in the Apocynaceae. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> shoot. Huge. Yeah, exactly. Well said, Mark. Pest is an ornamental feature. Why yeah. not? Yeah, I like that angle. <laughs> Some of our hearts aren't quite that open. Here, but. <laughs> okay, so somebody says, I planted two tomato plants this year. The early girl variety produced blooms, but no tomatoes. Okay. The better boy variety produced some tomatoes, but not a lot. In past years, I had good luck with these varieties. What could I have done to help them? Sometimes it's temperature related, sometimes on fruit set. Um, yeah. But nutritional, depending, are these in-ground, these container-grown? If, if this is somebody who's been growing tomatoes for a relatively short time, um, or a long time, but, but if they've gone over a couple of years from being really heavy producers to really doing much poorer, over, that is, if they're growing in the ground, it's probably nematodes, the root knot nematodes, which are in all of our North Carolina soils because of tobacco production, years and years and years of tobacco production everywhere in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And so there's not enough to do much damage for the first couple of years. They build up very quickly when they have your plants. The only solution for that is to grow your tomatoes in a different spot in your garden or to grow them not in the soil, to grow them in containers, raised beds, straw bales, things like that, hydroponics. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Okie dokie. Somebody says, my three pear trees looked great this spring with tons of flowers, but then we had a late spring frost. Some branches and leaves turned black. Uh -huh. I had no fruit. Was this fire blight or just damage from the late spring frost? I've never had fire blight before. It's both more than likely. This was a bad fire blight year with uh, the cool temperatures, the warm temperatures. We had a kind of a moist spring and fire blight was really bad. There's also um, a new-ish disease that's affecting pears. Um, I think it's pear trellis disease, which is good because it kills Bradford pear uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty quickly. And it might, there might be some of that going on. Um, there, I'm, I'm sensing and tasting a theme here that I like to tell people is there's a lot of heartbreak in gardening and, and horticulture, um, especially if you're growing food and you know vegetables. There's there's always something that's trying to outwit you, or or destroy what you're trying to grow. Um, pears like apples are in the rosaceae family. There's a bazillion diseases. There's even more insects that affect them. But fire blight has been really really bad. Um, I would say in the last five years it seems to get. Go and it's these, sexually these transmitted, valleys. right, through the yeah. flowers, the bees transmit. Yeah. So if you had a really good flowering. <laughs> and it spread, when rain hits it, it spread, it spread that way also. So it might be a combination of all those things. And unless you want to go down a route of, of chemicals and fungicides, um, you know, it's, it's one of those plants that's just, and particularly here, this is in an area where, where pears are pre prevalent for, for fruit production. Um, that's, that's the mid-Atlantic and the Midwest and the, the West Coast. Yeah. Okay. 
I love that you mentioned that gardening is full of heartbreak because <laughs> I was actually going back through the old uh, J.C. Ralston Arboretum newsletters that J.C. wrote back in the 80s. And he put a beautiful quote that I saved and have handy here that's actually relevant to that. Awesome. This is from The Essential Earthman by Henry Mitchell. And he says, everything grows for everybody. Everything dies for everybody, too. There are no green thumbs or black thumbs. There are only gardeners and non-gardeners. Gardeners are the ones who, ruin after ruin, get on with the high defiance of nature herself, creating in the very face of chaos and tornado, the bower of roses and the pride of irises. I like that. That's beautiful. That's yeah. great. And yeah. Jason Ralston liked that enough to publish it in one of our uh, uh, announce or newsletters that's, back in the day. That's fantastic. So, okay, let's move on to another question. Can you offer any advice or shortcuts for removing a 12-year-old yucca? I spent a sweaty hour yesterday tackling one and found myself wishing for a chain and a pickup truck. Uh, well, that was going to be my suggestion yeah. because even once you've gotten it out, the roots are still down there. The roots are down there, and they're going to you're going to get a whole fairy ring of yucca probably coming up around it. Um, I once dug chest deep to dig one out of a garden, and it still came back. The ones that if you come to the garden and you out at the front gate, there's some that were. Um, it took out before we did construction. The construction took place and it still came back up. It got run over numerous times by heavy equipment. I've just learned to live with them in the landscape af after that. So it's like, it'll slow them down and yeah. give them a bad day for a little while, but they're, they're pretty They're hard. persistent and yeah. shade that's, and wet. That's about the only thing that might ultimately kill them. Build a water garden on top of them. There you go. So <laughs> any advice or shortcuts, just love the yucca. <laughs> that's, that's the quickest way to do it. Okie dokie. Someone's asking, can you recommend any ferns that might be good for the equivalent of a shady rain garden that could be take that that could take being in water for a few hours to a day at most, but then would also be more drought tolerant when we haven't mm. had significant rain in a few hot weeks. Sure. So, yeah. um, uh, sensitive fern, mm -hmm. Anoclea sensibilis is a very, very drought tolerant fern, but it'll take periodic inundation. Um, the, uh, I've got just naturally occurring um, uh, Christmas fern in my property, uh, some of which gets inundated by, because I'm at the end of a cul-de-sac and the water runs down and it'll fill up in a spot. And um, so th that does it. I would think if you stuck with, I mean, the Christmas fern is a clumper, but a lot of the, the spreaders, mm -hmm. I would think, would tolerate that fairly well. Um, Pizia. That one's -A -A. a little, yeah, that's a little more difficult to find. But yeah, maybe um, uh, um, um, Philepterus acuminata likes to run everywhere. Uh, that's a really good one. Uh, it, the truth is there are probably a, quite a few good and ones and I'm just not sure of them. You know, the some of the ones that we do grow uh, uh, quite often in water, like cinnamon fern, mm -hmm. really do, isn't going to want to be bone dry for a long time. Um, if you get it established, it'll live, but yeah, not be happy. The, trouble. I see them out at the coast like that in royal fern, but they're in the ditches in the, the croatine where it can be parched, but it's yeah. also high water table at times yeah, too. Yeah, so. I, I would if you're going to do one of those, I'd go with royal fern over over cinnamon fern. Yeah, well, no, maybe I don't know which one I'd do honestly. So, but it's just not something that I've grown many ferns in wet soil or periodically wet, periodically yeah, yeah, super yeah. dry. So, okay. I'm sure there are plenty, but I don't know if I know them. Sure, well, that's a that's a reasonable answer. Oh, a break and fern issue, if all else fails. That thing. Sure. <laughs> break and fern is great. It grows everywhere in the world, every just continent. about. Uh, Except every for continent. Antarctica. And, uh, yeah. Okie dokie. <laughs> right, Might so regret it, though. Dan <laughs> here is asking, what are your experiences or knowledge or experience in grafting uh, cross X conifer genera, more specifically, Dawn Redwood to Bald Cypress? I've never heard of that. I, yeah, I, no, I think people. I've told me I've been. I think do that. Um, 
I, I I assume this is because you're you're Me? having trouble getting um, uh, uh, Don Redwood rootstock. Or would it be to prevent knees? Well, they said Don Red. They said, did you say Don Redwood and or or they said Don Redwood two bald cypress. So maybe yeah, they okay. want knees. Uh, well, no, probably just it's easier to get bald cypress rootstock. Uh, um, as fast as they grow, how would you do that? Well, if you wanted to, I guess for propagating a, you know, a cultivar, a cultivar um, yeah. although many of them root, uh, not in high percentages, but I, I, I think it can be done. I'm not sure the long term. I, I think Leanne has told me that she's if anybody's with that. doing it. Yeah, um, I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, there certainly are other cases. They're close of enough. Okie dokie. Uh, next question, how slash when do we prune crepe myrtles, uh, <laughs> tree type and bush type? So <laughs> I'll say what I always say, and then I'm going to pass it over to Greg, who's, who's um, great with the pruning information. If it flowers in summer, it's, it's forming buds on new wood. If it flowers in spring, it's forming buds on old wood. So if it flowers in summer like a crepe myrtle, you can prune, you prune generally late, uh, late winter, early spring, because it'll put out new growth and it'll flower, but you're not going to hurt your crepe myrtle. <laughs> no. Just prevent flowering if you do it too late. Yeah, that's, that's the easiest thing to do is, you know, you're going to, spring, spring is probably best, late winter. Um, the thing about winters now is we get these warm spells and things start to push and that new foliage can get hurt. So I like to tell people to do it in the, in the uh, early spring. You might, you know, it's going to form buds on that new wood and that's the best time to do it. And, and when we say prune, we don't mean do this. We mean go in and, and, and prune the, prune the plant selectively for shape and form. Same with uh, the smaller ones, they're all kind of the same. Um, those don't really need to be pruned that often because they're usually a right size for the landscape that they're put in. Um, and pruning them doesn't mean you're gonna get more flowers. A healthy plant is gonna produce a lot of flowers anyway. So the only reason you'd really need to prune is for form and for shape. Do you um, want a deadhead? And, de and deadhead, yeah. um, that, those are about the, the only reasons. So while we're in the vein of pruning, somebody's asking, how do you prune hydrangea? Which <laughs> I know is a long and complicated answer. <laughs> we need to write a book on that. <laughs> sell it for a lot of money. Well, so we, I think we get asked that. Depends what kind of hydrangea. A lot. So I'll go through. Let's start with our natives. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hydrangea arborescens can prune it to the ground every winter. Flowers on its new growth. Prune it to the ground. But easy, right? Oak leaf hydrangea. Minimal. Do very little pruning um, on it. it uh, one, it doesn't need it. Two, it's got beautiful shaggy red bark. Three, it flowers on old wood. Um, you grow them. Uh, panicle hydrangeas, the PG um, hydrangeas, many of the new cultivars, the ones that you're growing in full sun probably. Uh, those flower on new growth. You can cut them back hard, but you don't need to. Um, and they'll still flower. And then where it gets tricky are the, the big leaf magnolias, magnolia yeah. macrophyllus. Uh, hydrangeas. I mean, hydrangeas. <laughs> hydrangeas. It's a good thing we're all here together. No joke. <laughs> Hydrangea macrophyllus. Um, those flower on new growth on old growth. And so the best way to prune those is either lightly during the winter, just down two or three buds, and they got those big fat buds, you can see them, or to take out whole stems to thin it out and open it up. The old stems, get those out, and that'll, that will keep the plant healthiest and keep it flowering the best. Um, some of the reblooming ones, the, the, you know, the very popular reblooming types, Theoretically, you can cut them to the ground and they will come up and bloom. Um, I, you know, so they're kind of idiot proof. They really were bred for 
colder climates where they get killed back to the ground and they come back. I still think those flower better if you don't cut them back hard, if you, if you cut, prune them like you do other ones. And then they can rebloom for you, um, especially if you deadhead them. And then if you want to get into some of the, the weird hydrangea species that, you know, at, come here and, and yeah. talk to us in person. Yeah, for and there's sure. a lot of good information online. Um, I know for crepe myrtles, um, there's stuff on NC State's the extension sites. I know Clemson's done a ton of work on crepe myrtles, and they've done some. They've got some really good literature on pruning them and not topping them. I would direct people there, and there's equally good stuff online about uh, about the hydrangeas because people get confused. We get confused. It's it's easy for that to that to happen. Yes, and speaking of good information online about these topics, we, as a matter of fact, for Day of Giving, filmed a little segment on how to prune hydrangeas, and that video is presently on our YouTube channel. So I would go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and just acquaint yourself to the vast wealth of knowledge that we make available to you all. Okie dokie, moving on to another question. I have had difficulty getting spinach to sprout in the past few years. It used to sprout well. The lettuce and kale that is planted does not have this problem. Any ideas? What time of the year are they doing it? I will give them the benefit of the doubt, the appropriate time of year. <laughs> they like it when it's cooler. Yeah. We have had some hot years. Yeah. Maybe that yeah. it's the timing needs to be adjusted. The spinach may be a little bit more susceptible to that. Bolt, but honestly. I think you are mostly getting out of our strength here, mm. at least for me, for sure. <laughs> I can repeat things I know, but I do not vegetable garden. We've got a great I, farmer's market. I, 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 don't, I don't either. Um, yeah, I have an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. We, we do often have great classes with Bree Author and other people who do yeah. um, foodscaping. And so I would, I would encourage I'd you to think about Bree. that. Yeah, and we do have a class about foodscaping with Brie Arthur that is coming up on October. That is going to be a two-day event, so there's going to be a lecture on the morning of Saturday the 7th in October, and then there will also be a field trip to Brie Arthur's house the subsequent oh, wow. weekend, so you'll get to see her landscape and all of the wonderful edible food she's planted out there. So that would be a wonderful program to sign up for to explore this topic a little bit more. Okay, and, and, and I want to say, you know, we had questions about tomatoes, you know, um, questions about uh, uh, a couple questions about tomatoes, about spinach, whatever. You come to that class, and and that's that's there's a reason she's teaching that, and mm -hmm. not one of us is because we don't know the stuff. Yeah, and we sure. don't want to dissuade the questions. We'll take we'll take all questions. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah. take all questions. We just want to. There might be not, better not people put out for information us than us as definitive when we're wrong. <laughs> yeah. And why would you ask Mark the question when you could ask Brie Arthur the question? So. There's, some, there's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So, all right, somebody says we have about 24 blueberries. They send up shoots each year. Mm -hmm. When is the best time to take the shoots and put them into pots? I assume these are root mm -hmm. suffers coming up. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, are they? Yeah. How did you get them? I mean, you could dig them off, but that could be. I mean, yeah, I mean, you just yeah, kind of cut them up cut and, them off. and probably dig in them the winter, off. I would think. Uh, yeah, a late uh, late winter would probably be. Yeah, that's when I like doing those that kind of thing. Is yeah. you, in late winter, you dig it, you pot it, and it is just getting ready to really bust into growth, and so it gets going. The other option, and I like this more if you're transplanting mm -hmm. rather than in the in moving them into pots is uh, dig in the, in the fall. Mm -hmm. After things have cooled down, the air is cool and it's gonna hopefully stay fairly cool. You never know around here, but the ground is still warm. So if you do it then and you transplant it in your garden, the, the roots can continue to grow uh, and get them in a better shot uh, for spring. But if yeah. you're going into a container, my preference would probably be to do it uh, over towards spring, late winter, yeah, even in definitely. spring. Yep, for sure. Okay, next question. We have several gardenias. We did not prune them this year and they did not bloom. That has never happened before. Was there something unusual about this year that impacted gardenias? 
ours took a hit in the garden this year uh, with the the cold spell the end of december and a lot of the buds were damaged back so they were doing some recovery this year so we we got fewer earlier flowers and you'll get a few scattered ones throughout the season then but you don't get that main um full display on some of the ones uh if they got damaged i had some in my home garden in charlotte and they got hammered by that cold snap um one died to the ground the other ones they never they, i had no flowers mm -hmm. yeah and I, I want to just address the beginning of that, the, the we didn't prune this year and they didn't flower. You don't need to prune plants every year. I almost never prune plants except for to shape them in my home garden. If you're pruning it because it's getting too big every year, you've got the wrong plant in the, the wrong spot. Um, <clears throat> pruning should be done for health, for aesthetics, uh, it can be done for size control, but generally not, it shouldn't be every year. It should be, you know, the shrub grows and gets big. You cut out some of the older growth, reduce the size, and, you know, in a few more years, you may need to do that or to rejuvenate a plant. But pruning every year is not a necessity. No, on and it, thinking about trees, young trees require some structural pruning, but that's very species dependent. And it's, not every year. You want a young tree after you plant it. There, there was that <clears throat> kind of a, a adage that you, when you planted, you did a bunch of pruning right before you put the plant in the ground while you're able to do that. And that plant needs as much of its resources to build that root system back up. But young trees and very species dependent need a little more eye on and might require some, you know, every couple years kind of pruning. You know, elms are, are notorious for needing that. Some of the maples are, but, you know, I get the question all the time when I'm in the garden, that's, you know, you must have an army of staff here that just nothing but prune. Well, no, you don't have to prune everything. Um, right plant, right place, and, uh, you know, for, for shape, for dead wood, crossing branches, that's about it. Yeah, and I can take it one step further. I grow bonsai trees and <laughs> ideally I can get to a point where I don't have to prune them one year. And that's the ideal situation. Yeah. Like you have to prune every year to get to the point where you can skip a year pruning, but ideally yeah. you can just let them go and rejuvenate because they do yep. need time to recover. Hmm. Okie dokie. Do you cut back to the ground all the foliage from gladiolus daylilies any bulbs after they bloom or do you just leave them through the winter? It depends. Mm -hmm. Now that is through the winter, pro yeah, I would cut, you can probably clean them up if you want and cut them to the ground. But the, the, the gladiolus, let them die down on their own because that's gonna feed the corm for next year's growth. And also the, the cormals, the little baby corms it forms on the sides. So that's gonna help them propagate. The daylilies, I mean, they can go semi-dormant midsummer and they'll look a little ratty and you can yeah. cut them back if you really want to. And, and there are, there are evergreen yeah, daylilies day yeah. and there are deciduous daylilies. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'll know which one you have if it goes pretty much completely yeah. dormant in winter. Um, but I do, after they flower, uh, ones that are, if you don't have really reblooming daylilies, um, I find that the easiest thing to do is, and, and they're evergreen, is to cut them back pretty much right after they finish flowering and let them reflush, and they'll, they'll tend to look better over a longer period. Um, sometimes I'll wait until we get a little bit, you know, closer to this time of year. That way they're fresh as we go into fall and winter, because if you do it too early, they can be a little raggedy going through the winter too. Also cleans them up because we, I don't know if we, we get some of the um, daily uh, leaf miner now and you can mm -hmm. cut them back and, that, and just uh, get rid of that debris then. And that'll hopefully help some of that um, from reoccurring as much. Yep. Okay, so earlier we had a question that might be better suited to an entomologist. This question might be better suited to a mathematician or an engineer. <laughs> okay. Perfect, this is for me. All right, I'll read the whole thing. It's pretty long, right? If okay. a train leaves... <laughs> I've heard many times that one should amend the bed, not the hole. The reason being that amending the hole essentially creates a bowl that fills with water. This leaves the plant sitting in water for an extended period of time. Is this the correct reason? Won't a one foot by one foot hole fill the same depth of water as a 10 foot by 10 foot bed? Will a larger area drain faster for some reason? I suppose there is a way to look at this mathematically that might explain it. 
Perhaps water isn't the issue and it has more to do with making the soil easier for the roots to spread wide and far. Or is it something else? It is, it is a little bit of a couple of those things. One, if you do just the hole, that one foot by one foot hole, yes, it fills with water and all your roots are right there. If you, if you do amend a whole 10 foot bed, um, depending on how you amend it, it, you can go up with it. So then there's water that kind of drains out uh, in different directions. But even if you go down, you don't go down and scrape it smooth and everything and then fill it with something. You are amending the soil. You are mixing existing soil with non-existing soil. And there'll be lots of ways. There are roots from trees that are already there. There are ways for water to escape that much better than if you dig this small hole for a small plant. If, if you insist on amending the hole for your plant, when you dig that hole, dig it wide, um, but also don't get in there and have a nice smooth edge on there. Get in there and take your shovel and jam it in the sides and rake it and break up as much as you can so that you're not have, you don't have this you know, surface to surface like that, but you have a lot of breaks in it where your other soil is going through. I actually, with small plants, you know, I, I always talk about I like planting small plants. I don't plant with a shovel. I plant even in my unamended woodland soil with a hoary hoary knife, you know, a gardening knife. And I just go in, I don't dig a hole. I jam it in there and jam it in there and jam it and kind of turn the soil until I can plant the plant, you know, I kinda, and then I kind of scoop out some soil, put it in, put it around. It's not digging out a, soil, putting it here and putting this in and packing it in around. It is, I'm making sure that all that area where I'm planting is, uh, is kind of getting broken up and isn't smooth. And in fact, when I'm planting larger things in my woodland, I sometimes go out with a pickaxe and use that rather than a shovel. I find it much easier. And I do the same thing with a pickaxe. I'll dig a nice size hole for a three gallon plant um, with that. I go through the roots. I don't have to worry about that get the rocks out and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I much prefer that. Yeah, the, the smaller hole is in essence, you're creating another container. So you're yeah. taking a plant out of the container, putting it in a small hole. And Mark mentioned scoring up that side, the, the, the you know, arboriculture term is it becomes glazed if you're just cutting it with your shovel and the roots are gonna hit it and just continue to go around. So just scoring that side lets those roots tuck into those little corners and, and, and slits and start to break up that soil, which is what you want it to, what you want it to do. Um, and, you know, if you're amending that glazed hole, they're, again, they're just going to stay in that one little, mm -hmm. little spot. So doing a bigger area, you know, and it doesn't need to be perfectly symmetrical. That's the nice thing about what you're doing with the pickaxe and with the, the hori hori. You know, roots are going to go in those opportunistic areas where there's moisture and not as much compaction. Awesome. Okay, someone says the topmost branches of our yellowwood tree were hit by severe frost and lost all their leaves. The lower branches were not affected. What should we do about the dead branches? Yellowwoods are tricky. Mm. Um, you know, if the branches are, are dead, you know, you could, you could prune them out in hopes that, you know, those areas will kind of recover, um, you know, the, the stress that that tree incurred from that, it's important to have been paying attention to this hot weather that we've had so that, that it doesn't dry out, making sure it gets enough organic matter by mulching around it, doing those cultural things that'll help the plant to, to kind of go through that, that stress. Um, Sophia says you can hug it and be nice to it. <laughs> it might enjoy that and be, and, and, and be happy and turn the corner. Um, we, yellow, yellow woods have become susceptible to um, bacterial leaf scorch, which is a viral disease, oh. that affects them. Uh, you know, a tree that's under stress. We've seen that in a lot of a lot of yellow woods. Um, there's some other things that they get when they when they get older for for whatever reason. Um, but I've I've had mixed success with those over my my, my career of them doing really well or, or really really poorly. Yeah, I I will say if it's a tall tree, you know. I probably wouldn't do anything if it was in my home landscape. Um, if it's something that really concerns you, and I do love a, a yellow wood, if they're, if they're a nice they're grown one, they're incredible. Um, if it's tall and you really feel like it needs some, some help, get a 
uh, a good arborist in Somebody to look, look at, at it. it. The ones that that we we don't recommend arborists, but the we'll just tell you that the ones we use here um, are leaf and limb and Bartlett tree experts. Uh, they're you know they're, they're really good and can assess kind of whole tree health. Um, but in general, if it had been in my garden, I probably would have left it. But I'm glad you mentioned something about the weather. I started here in 2007. For those who've been gardening here that long, remember that we had an awful yes. Easter freeze and then we had a hundred year drought. Yes. And it was many trees we didn't see until the following year, them going downhill because of the stress on top of stress on top of stress. And, and sometimes trees take a while to really show you. Mature trees, issues. you really don't see that for, for a couple years. So you might go through a traumatic climate or weather event or stress um, and you won't see it for, for a couple of years. So it's important to, to do those, those cultural things. If it's a big, mature, kind of cherished tree, I would get somebody to come out and look at it. It'd be worth, worth every penny to do that. And, and the moral of this is if it, if it is a big tree, you really want to go hug it. <laughs> like Sophia behind the camera says. No, I Although I thought she was saying baby it, oh. not hug it, but she either way. Hug. No, hugging trees is nice. It, hugging trees is nice. Think. It is. <laughs> we should, we should do a class on that. We should. We get some <laughs> Laditzia. <laughs> the water oh, yeah. Love it. Verbenias. Definitely. Mm. Okay, next question. Some of my gladiolas and bearded irises did not bloom this year. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions for what to do over the winter to ensure blooms next season? Mm. I, they, the gladi I mean, the iris might need dividing. I mean, mm. they are notorious after a couple years, they Exhausting need themselves. to get reset, throw out a third of them at least, maybe <laughs> half of them, and just put a few of them back in, let them resettle. You probably won't get flowers the first year unless it's a reblooming one that's super vigorous. The gladiolus, uh, they may just need dividing too, but those you can space out and they will typically flower um, from relatively small corms uh, the first year again. So, uh, and it could be shading too. I don't know what they're growing, what's growing around them. Sometimes the lighting uh, situation changes and that also prevents them from uh, flowering. And if they're bearded iris, they want full blazing sun to do their best. So uh, gladiolus are meh, they're not much better for that. They want a lot of sun. So that's just my guess. Yeah. And, and suggestions. Too late for it now. If you divide your iris, like Tim said, probably won't bloom next season. I like to divide my iris immediately after they flower because then I can usually get blooms the following year. The, the conventional wisdom and, and what people tell you is you wait until fall before dividing them and then you lose a year of flowering and I've, I've never had a problem dividing irises in the middle so of the summer. Tough. And then don't plant them too deep. Yes. If you plant, if you plant, you want irises with their rhizomes right at the top of the soil basically, you can mulch a little bit over it, but if you plant too deep, um, you can, they can struggle and not, not, they can rot and not bloom. Okie dokie. So there's a lot to unpack in this next, in this next question. So let's, let's get through it. So typically it is recommended not to amend directly, sorry, typically it is recommended not to amend directly under your tree or shrub that you are planting. You only want to amend along the sides of where you're planting it for fear of the plant sinking when it's in the hole. They said when you plant a tree in which you see all of the roots at the bottom of the root ball, as with Stuoria malacodendron I lately planted, wouldn't this constitute an exception? Uh, I'm not 100% sure all that. Well, and amending around something that's planted is not gonna have the plant sink. Correct. Um, so that's not a problem. Often, Bald and burlap and containerized trees, but I'm finding it even it worse in bald and burlap trees. Yeah, is, but, but containers is when they're dug with a tree spade and lifted out, there is excess soil on the top. It, takes, it would take a long time to move that. And I've seen it four or six inches deep that mm -hmm. soil is pulled up with that. That is not removed generally, it is just put in there bald and burlap. Same thing with containers, you're potting up a tree and you put it in another pot. It's real easy to plant that too, too deep and you put the soil in so it looks nice or it's sat too long in the pot and the, the soil has 
compressed, uh, broken down, like we were talking about with raised beds. And so it's topped with some more soil, maybe once or twice. So it looks good when you get it. So when you get that plant, no matter what, you wanna scrape away some of the top of the soil for a tree, you know, really look for that root flare where it widens out. And that's the level, you don't wanna plant any lower than that. If you have a really heavily amended bed, uh, that's amended deep, plant a little bit high because it can, it can settle. You're better off planting a bit high and, and mulching over that than you are planting deep, yeah. always. And it's also worth noting, so roots grow where there's water and oxygen. So when you pull that tree out of the pot and there's a huge mass of roots down at the bottom of that pot, like the roots were there because that was the only place where there was oxygen for roots to grow. And like, that was clearly a very pot bound plant that you yeah. pulled out of the pot. And so it would be a good idea to loosen up that root ball and probably cut off that huge mass of roots down at the bottom because roots grow where there's water and oxygen. So if you put it in the ground, like there's not as much oxygen deep down, the oxygen's up towards the top. So it's gonna spread along the surface of the ground. The roots are gonna grow up there rather than down below. So bust up your root ball and, and then plant it. Okie dokie. Uh, next question. What ground covers do you recommend for steep stone paths? The stone set well, it's stable and level, and there's a reasonable rise, they want a ground cover for the risers. And they're asking if this makes sense. So they want a ground cover for the, the risers. The, oh. yeah. So they've got flat stone and then soil kind of as the riser. Is that what we're? Assume. Nancy, would you clear? She says correct. Is it between the stones? Is that what you're? No, it's the riser. So she's got stone and it's sitting on soil and then, you know, another stone and more soil. Mm -hmm. So the soil is the vertical it's piece. Vertical. Um, yes. Boy, uh, you know, you could use something that is, you grow like a, you know, a, a vine, like um, creeping fig, yeah. which would cover it. But if you're looking for something that's gonna hold that vertical soil surface, uh, I would say, no, there isn't much that'll really do that. Um, is it gonna get foot traffic? It's not getting foot traffic? The, no, the, the tread will get foot traffic, yeah. but the riser won't. If you could get it in sheets, um, <laughs> dwarf, I mean, dwarf. Um, dwarf Mondo. Uh, Mondo. Yeah, Dwarf Mondo maybe. If you got it in um, sheets. You know, the, the problem is, if you've got that as the riser for steps, it's, it's got to be really compacted yeah, in compressed. order to stay there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, so once you loosen that up enough to plant things in there, I'd be afraid you're going to look, you're going to start messing with the structure. structural stability of your whole of your stairway. It's going to move. Moisture yeah. Too. I don't, I don't yeah, moisture is going to be a real, a real tough one. Maybe if it's shading, maybe moss. Yeah, I mean. And it's gotta be moist. Sophia's not Mike, but she just suggested if it's shady, you might do moss if it Where might be able get to get moss? it established. I don't know. There are places moss to get rocks. moss, and yeah, it really, it used to be. It, you, it really there, that's moss a good rocks. suggestion because there are mosses that really do want it compacted and dry. I mean, that's if you go out in your lawn, you see big patches of moss, it's because it's compacted, terrible soil, super acidic. So um, that's that's why you're getting that instead of, of grass. So yeah, there are there are ones that could work, but there will need some pretty even those need will need some pretty significant water to get established, and I'm not sure how well they'll stay established. For sure, I can tell you something we did in Japan with moss to get moss to affix to like rock faces and crevices. You just take a little bit of wire and bend it into a pin and then you just put the moss up there mm. and stick the pin in there. And I'm not saying the moss will then adhere to that wall of soil, but I'm saying if it has the potential to do it, that would be how to make it do it. Um, just stick a pin in there and if it clings, it clings. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I definitely yeah. want to learn about moss uh, propagation probably. It'd be uh, an interesting thing. Oh. Uh, vine idea again, Trachelospermum. Yeah. yeah. Um, It'll cling and craw uh, crawl across. The, the Trachelospermum is a great one, and there's some great little leaf ones that, yeah, that we ones. grow that 
I think would probably look more in scale and stay and be easier to control. Um, and part of the thing with that and the creeping fig is you can kind of part, plant them to the side mm -hmm. where they can establish and then just direct them to grow in. I do have stone steps. I don't, the, my risers are so stone, but um, I grow things that kind of grow in the cracks. And uh, so I, I grow um, the tongue ferns, pyrosias do really well uh, along there. Um, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of little things that will creep in like crevices yeah. like that, but it's the, the um, flat surface I think is tough. Okie dokie. Well, we are coming up on the end of our horticulture hour, so we will do one final question. Question is, we have peonies that have been fickle in blooming. We have moved them to more sun and tried to raise them because they require more cold hours to bloom. Any thoughts on how to get peonies to consistently do well each year here in Raleigh? Oh, just good light. Um, and. Uh, leave them alone once they're established for the most part. Yeah, they yeah, don't kind of like to move. Off, you kind of, yeah, they don't like to be moved a lot. Um, you, know, you can divide them and share them, yeah. but if you're moving around a lot, they're not gonna be able to build up to, to flower. It, that's always been a plant in my garden that you, you stick in the ground, just walk away yeah. from it and it does its thing yeah. and you cut them back in the, you know. They'll the, take, once they're established, they're drought tolerant. I mean, they're they need, cold yeah, tolerant. They need, they need light. Yeah. Light to produce yeah. flowers. Well, and, and the other thing that, that they did mention is you don't want to plant them deep. Yeah. Um, tree peonies for sure, um, but but other peonies as well. You want to plant them shallow. So if they've done that, it may just be that now that they moved them into an area of more light, they they plant them better. That they're, they're just going to take a, a year or two to settle in and really get going. But they should they should really um, really get going now. They are. Um, they don't necessarily require it, but but to really keep them flowered well, some you know organic matter, compost, lime. or um, and some lime. Yeah, if you have very yeah, acidic soils, I I never lime mine, but and never have a problem. But yeah. Okay. Well, that about wraps up our horticulture hour today. So thank you, Mark and Greg and Tim, for fielding all these questions. Thank you everybody for joining us today and giving your questions that we have something to talk about for a little bit. We will be back next week on the midweek program. Uh, we're gonna be doing September gardening task, Garden 101. So join us next Wednesday at three o'clock for that. We will see you all then. Y'all take care. <laughs>